Welcome to America's Heroes Group. Good afternoon and welcome to America's Heroes Group. Roundtable Legally Speaking with Steve. April is Sexual Assault and Autism Awareness Month. It's Saturday, April 30th, 2022. I am co-founder, Vietnam veteran, and host, Cliff Kelly. The Honorable Cliff Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> I am his co-host, Colonel Dr. Damon Arnold. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith. Digital media producer is the impeccable Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And today, it's a topic. We have a partner with us I'm always, always pleased to speak to. It's Steve J. Seidman, the founding attorney of Seidman Law Office, with over 30 years as an experienced trial lawyer focused on personal injury. Steve is America's Heroes Group partner, sponsor, and advisory board member. Um, if you have a problem and you're a veteran out there, a family member, go to Steve, and he will take care of your problems for you. So, Attorney Seidman, how are you doing? I am well. Thank you very much. And uh, it's nice to talk to you, Doctor and Governor. Uh, you too. Uh, wonderful to hear you guys. Yeah, and um, I know your discussion today is about the 2020 updates on legal issues, so we are ready to hear your uh, – I know you do so much work helping veterans and, and uh, figuring out what do we need to know. Well, in this in this week, I'd like to just focus initially to start on this, Dr., mm-hmm. on the burn pits. And uh-huh. if you'd imagine in your head a football field, uh, at least the size of a football field, filled – with all kinds of, uh, uh, of stuff that's toxic, waste for military bases, let's say unspent uh, ammunition, mm-hmm. uh, plastics, rubber, chemical mixtures, medical waste, waste. And imagine the pit burning all day to get rid of this waste. Um, and uh, this is how uh, actually until t- the mid-2010, uh, that the military disposed of waste uh, waste at their facilities and their bases. So um, in the meantime, these pits burned uh, continually. And uh, in recent months, it's been gained, you know, the topic's been gaining prominence. And uh, the reason it, for that is, is that many people, unbeknownst, got cancer from, from being exposed to these types of burning pits. Yeah. These, the fires that were caused in these pits were massive fires. Uh, one of the largest bases in, in Iraq, uh, uh, it's called Joint Base Balad, the burn pit, imagine this, covered nearly 10 acres of land, 10 acres of this, this toxic waste being burnt with resulting smoke passing over the entire base as the wind shifted. And in 2008, it became an issue. In fact, President Biden's son died of brain cancer. And I think it got recently a a lot of uh, attention because there was some speculation that perhaps this cancer might have been caused by the fact that he was exposed to the burn pits at the military bases overseas. Since 2008, numerous studies and reports definitely suggested links between the poor air quality and rare cancers found in increasing numbers among post-911 veterans. Believe it or not, the Department of Defense estimated nearly 3.5 million troops from recent wars may have suffered enough exposure uh, to the smoke that caused health problems. Now, it's been um, uh, gaining more and more support, the airborne uh, hazards and burn pit exposures, And just this last week, uh, there was a burn pit bill passed by Congress. And I want to spend a little bit of time going through that bill because I don't know how many of the veterans and our listeners who are out there might have been exposed to these pits. Mm -hmm. They certainly would know it because they could smell the smoke and they could see a football field side pit being burnt. But um, uh, just on, on April 28th, 2021, which we know is just this week, the Senate, in a bipartisan agreement, required the, the, the Department of Veteran Affairs to concede 
that, in fact, veterans who were exposed to certain toxic substances and chemicals and hazards from burn pits uh, while they were in active duty could now uh, actually request uh, uh, cancers uh, for certain cancers, and there were a lot of them. Uh, there, it, it, first of all, you have to be in the Iraq War, August 2nd, 90, through February 28th, 91, as well as from March, 20, March 19th to 23, until burn pits were no longer used at the location. Southwest Asia, including Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Oman, and Qatar, from April 2, 1990, until the burn pits were no longer used in those locations. Afghanistan, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, Yemen, and uh, Chipotle from September 11, 2001, until burn pits were no longer used in litigation in those locations. Under the bill, if an exposed veteran submits insufficient evidence to establish a service connection for purposes of disability compensation, the VA shall provide a medical exam and request a medical opinion regarding the causal link between the disability, toxin, and hazard. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it just recently we know that the uh, House passed this uh, and, in fact, um, is now going to cover a lot of different um, uh, the cancers, and it was bipartisan. And I think it's finally being recognized that after all these millions, 3.8 or 4 million people, um, have been exposed to this, they can now file disability uh, and get immediate help uh, for, for some vets. Okay, so that's very important that people realize. And, Doctor, I don't know, when you were um, uh, fighting overseas, did, did you were you ever exposed to burn pits? Oh, most definitely. Um, I, was, I was in Mosul. I went through Balad, Tikrit, um, multiple areas, Arif John. Um, but they, they had those. And I didn't realize in Balad the extent of what you were talking about, 10 acres. I mean, that's a huge uh, swath of land where they're burning things. I, I know we were smelling that stuff constantly. Uh, we also had the JP fuel, you know, from uh, and from uh, the, the actual exhaust from fumes from generators because generators were made to actually be underground. They're in the ground, you're supposed to bury it and put it into a pit. But these were above ground because it was so it was so hot there that you could not put the generators in the ground because they would uh, they would cause them to de malfunction and then become inoperable. So uh, those things we were constantly exposed to, and then sanitation, field sanitation was also a problem. But uh, you know, so definitely those things we were exposed to, and then we had to also the depleted uranium, you know, tritium. Uh, that was also a big hazard that uh, people had come in contact with, and uh, many of us had documented that in our files as well. So um, it, would this be fires that would burn continually, or, or would they just, from what I'm understanding, some of these fires would just continually burn 24-7 um, and uh, just keep on going? Yeah, I mean, it's just like a forest fire, you know. <laughs> you, 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 once you start a forest fire, you know, trying to put it out or to stop it, it was just like throwing more trash on top of the burning heat, you know, pile. Uh, just like we throw charcoal on top of a grill when we think that uh, the grill is about to go out when, you know, when they're having barbecues. Uh, it was the same kind of thing where it was just a continuous uh, burning. Well, when I was I was most impressed about this particular bill is that it was bipartisan, as I said, and was brought yeah. to the floor. It was actually started a year ago, March 26, 21. We, we talked a little bit about it in the last year. But it, 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 the fact that it was brought within a year and from its inception yeah. uh, to when it was uh, actually uh, – uh, passed, which is this last week, is is really quite something. Yeah, and I think um, on behalf of all the veterans, we have to commend those uh, congressional members that, you know, uh, actually stood up and did the right thing on a bipartisan uh, platform. You know, our country needs to come together, uh, you know, to do to solve a lot of the problems that we have throughout the country, but certainly the issues surrounding veterans' health are uh, one of those things that come to the top of the list uh, for, you know, people who s sacrifice their lives and put their lives on the line for the country. So I'm, I'm glad, so glad you brought that up, Steve, because uh, that's the kind of thing that makes our country great. Is that it, it, uh, <laughs> I will say that, you know what, as, as one, uh, I think it was Schumer said, 
uh, Senator Schumer, and there's war, there's all kinds of things you're not aware of, and people suffer. It's our job to make sure we take care of them once they come back. And we're not going to rest until we deal with burn pits and all the other illnesses that people acquire because they fought for us and risked their lives for us and risked freedom for us. Yeah. If you'd imagine, say, 9-11, okay, we go back to then, and, and all the firefighters and all the first mm-hmm. responders who were exposed to all of uh, the, the, the toxic waste, the fumes, the, yeah. everything that was left after the Twin Towers fell. And, you know, if you think about it, those, those firefighters in large numbers uh, get cancer and many can- types of different cancers. And very quickly, they were, uh, there were bills passed to take care of uh, their exposures. And now I'm glad to say that uh, the VA uh, is going to have to deal with this, and it's probably going to cost over a billion dollars. Um, but there are a lot, of, um, a lot of conditions caused by all of this solid waste burning, jet gasoline, everything you can imagine thrown into these things. Yeah. And I'm, I agree. I think it's a it's a wonderful bill, and it passed very quickly. The last time I was here last month, it was up on the floor of the House, and it even passed that quickly and went to the Senate. So um, it is a very good thing. Yeah, um, and one thing, one thing also, you know, Steve, that happened, uh, and I think it's of note, is that uh, you had sandstorms there. So we had uh, sandstorms where you had a very fine particulate dust because. Uh, heavy vehicles grind sand into pulp, into like almost like talcum powder. So that was actually floating in the air, and it was actually picking up some. Those particles can actually unite with other things that are in the air and uh, sustain in the air in a sustained fashion. We were covered with that uh, talcum powder throughout for days at a time, and you couldn't you couldn't even see down the road. You know, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face sometimes because it was so uh, thick in the air. And so I think they need to be looking at that particulate exposure in combination with those chemicals that they may have been adherent to the, some of those particles as well. And so uh, th- there is a lot of research that needs to be done on that. Right. And I think as we, as, as the time goes on, we're going to probably find more hazards and, and uh, environmental uh, things that uh, uh, people in, in reservists and, and, and active service were, were actually exposed to that will cause these health problems. And, and we get into the, uh, the treatment of veterans, if I could just take a, a minute or two, and then we'll get into other legal updates. But this is something that we're gonna be working on, I, I think, in the next month. And that is the, uh, the VA claim process, discrimination towards uh, people of color. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, uh, there is this case at, at Yale that's been brought um, that says there's an inordinate amount of uh, denials uh, for those people of color uh, compared to white folks uh, and in the VA claims process for disability. Um, there right now is a Freedom of Information Act uh, a case pending with Yale University Law School kind of spearheading it. Uh, it's in federal court. And the basis of, of what's been going on is is that when people get to the claim center, and this may indeed be the burn pits uh, as well, that people get treated fairly, right? That uh, people of color get treated just like uh, other people get treated. But there has been over the time period of years uh, what has been alleged to be inordinate um, discrimination. And what we're trying to do is to try to uncover the statistics uh, so that we could determine whether or not that's true or not. Now, Yale... The law school is behind it, but let's face it, as we know, unless there is some movement, I don't think we're going to have a bipartisan movement to figure this one out. So I think at the end of the day, uh, what we're going to need is a little political heat, so to speak. So I know Cliff and our executive producer, Glenda Smith, have been working to try to get uh, Congressman Claiborne and Davis, and I think if any of the listeners um, uh, know of any of their Congress people, men or women who could uh, kind of lend a hand here. We've seen a lot of um, things change in the five or six years that I've been part of this process. And um, uh, we need some change to determine whether or not there's been discrimination. Um, yeah, and, you, know, and, and, you know, the most current leadership theories and that kind of thing are leaning towards uh, 
critical social theory, you know, where you uh, the opt- ultimate objective of it is to have uh, social justice. So that's something that we all should be supporting in any way we can. Yes, and I'm, and social justice not only takes uh, the uh, among race relations and that type of things, but even among our reservists and, and uh, uh, veterans, um, here's a case that the Supreme Court just this last week, this last term examined, and they examined an Army reservist allegation that Texas did not treat him properly after the war. So what does that mean? You know, when you come back in, if you're in a reservist and you're called off of your job at Walmart or wherever you're working at, there's something called the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, U.S.E.R.R.A., and that makes it illegal for employers uh, to discriminate uh, 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 to discriminate on the basis of military service. By the way, I think I just it was Clyburn, not Claiborne, sorry, Clyburn. Um, yes, uh, yes. I, I pronounced it. I apologize. Uh, in any event. So uh, there was a trooper, Leroy Torres, out of Texas, Mm -hmm. and he went away and he came back and he was exposed to, guess, burn pits. And he he said that he was was very sickened by the burn pits uh, exposure. Um, And uh, so he claimed that he was injured by burn pits in Iraq. When he returned to Texas, he said his medical condition did not allow him to resume his duties as a state trooper, and he asked the state for a different job. Uh, the state refused, and he sued under that act that we just talked about. Ah. The interesting part about this and why it went to the Supreme Court of the United States was that Texas is a state, obviously. And states, as opposed to private parties, it seems to be our immune from this act. So, in other words, if I came back and you're a reservist, the state of Illinois, Texas, Missouri, whatever – does not have to hire you back after you've been uh, in service. And, in fact, the Supreme Court is now trying to hash that out. And uh, uh, Stephen Breyer, who is obviously retiring, mm-hmm. but he says this has the potential of being a pretty important case for the structure of the United States of America. Mm-hmm. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh said the court's decision could have an immediate significance for military readiness. And the reason for that is, obviously, you want your reservists to be able to come back uh, after they fight for you and to have a job, right? You don't want to lose your livelihood. And um, uh, that is exactly why um, uh, the this act was, was en- enacted. Now, we recently saw a case in the federal court here in Illinois, right here in the Northern District, yeah. where Volvo got sued. Uh, they won actually but it went to it went to trial same type of um of of, of uh i believe it was volvo i could be wrong on the name of the of the company but mm-hmm. there was a jury verdict for the company uh saying that there was not this discrimination and, and there were other reasons why this particular person um uh was was let go okay. um i want to talk about a couple of other things since i've only have three minutes left yeah, three I, minutes. I see that yeah one, 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 actually one I yeah love, yeah I, there was one thing that, uh, you know, when you were talking that, you know, some people had told me that they would get the uh, disability um, issues resolved, but they, they would get a letter back from uh, the, the government saying, okay, so we do give you a percentage of disability for the burn pits, right, for your exposure. However, yeah. that when it comes down to the final line, it just says it's not service-connected. So there's a discrepancy between what they're saying as it being service connected and whether it's just a granting of a of a coverage because of the bill. And the well, here, here, mm-hmm. here here's the difference to that, if I could, Doctor. Yeah, yeah. This particular bill, it establishes a presumption of service connection for 23 conditions. Ah. So there's a presumption that if you have 23 conditions, and I could I could probably get something off to tell you what those 23 are. I can't do it in two minutes, but the bottom line is that including respiratory conditions and cancers. Mm-hmm. That if, you're, if you have those, there's a presumption. It's presumed that those conditions are now caused by it. So okay. people who are dying from lung cancers, respiratory illness, those people now, as opposed to before when you would just be denied, there's a presumption. Now, if you're denied, what you need to do is to appeal the denial of any service-related uh, disability. 
Mm -hmm. um, and um, this PACT Act, and that's what this is called, P-A-C-T Act, all caps, is, is now giving presumptions. Okay. And when you're presumed, that's a big deal. Okay. Yeah, okay, Steve, you know we're running out of time, and uh, but I'm going to talk to Glenda. We need to have you on for a couple of hours every mm -hmm. time you come on because what you're yeah. telling us is such it's so fundamentally important to our service members and their families, and I have to applaud you uh, for what you do uh, every day trying to help our service members and, and, making, and succeeding, too, and, and making sure that they are taken care of in their families. And, um, you know, they, they wouldn't be pushing anything through legislation if it weren't people for people like you that bring right. this, I want to say this the issue thing. forward. Yeah, I so, need to say the same thing, Steve. Yeah. So we have to really thank, thank uh, yeah. our America's Heroes Group Roundtable, legally speaking, with Steve. Uh, Steve Seidman, you walk on water for the veterans, and I tell you, we are so happy to have you on board. And we're going to move on to a commercial break, uh, but we're going to have Steve back. Linda's saying yes. <laughs> uh, thank you, Steve.